morning and welcome to today's Friends Life Care Wellness Webinar on Improving Sleep for Better Health, presented by Dr. Phil Grumman. I hope that you're all doing well and staying healthy. My name is Gail Tamarchio and I'm the Friends Life Care Director of Wellness Initiatives, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. You should have received an email from Friends Life Care Vigor about 45 minutes ago with two short questionnaires about your sleep patterns. If you did not receive it, you will see the handouts in your attendee interface. You can see the handouts, all you need to do is click on those and you can open them. And Dr. Gurman also shared his presentation, um, which is also here in the attendee interface that you can use. All right, before we get started, I'd like to just go over a few housekeeping slides just to make sure you know how to fully participate in today's webinar. So you should see something that looks like this on your screen. This is an example of the attendee interface. It should be in the upper right corner of your screen. And you're listening in by default on your computer's um, audio system in, or your computer or your phone or your tablet, what, you know, whichever you're listening on. If for some reason you prefer to listen over the phone, just click on the telephone button and the log and the um, dial-in information will be displayed. Now, during today's presentation, Dr. Gurman may ask you a few questions, and if so, just click on this yellow um, hand with the green arrow, and he will see your response. Also, you may type in questions in this um, question, in, question box at any time during the webinar. Um, and Dr. Gurman will answer all your questions today. Um, he may not an, answer them at the exact time that you ask them um, because he you know, may know that he's going to be covering that material later. Um, he has very um, generously offered to stay on until the presentation is um, until the presentation is um, over and all the questions have been answered. All right, so um, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Phil Gurman. Dr. Gurman is an Associate Professor of Psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and a clinical psychologist at the Philadelphia VA Medical Center. He, direct, oops, sorry. he directs a sleep neurobiology and psychopathology lab at Penn. Um, he has an active research program exploring the um, I'm sorry, he has an active research program exploring the mechanisms and treatment of sleep and circadian dysregulation in the context of mental health disorders. Dr. Gurman's clinical specialization is on the delivery of cognitive behavioral and chronotherapeutic interventions for insomnia, circadian rhythm disorders, and other sleep disorders. The overarching goal of his work is to advance the understanding of the links between sleep and mental illness through translational research that spans from biology to therapeutics. Um, and he has um, agreed to kind of tailor his presentation today to talk about um, what's going on in today's circumstance and how it could be affecting sleep. Dr. Garman, thank you so much for joining us today. We're just delighted to have you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, so as Gail said, I am happy to, I have some, some content that I will cover, but please at any point jump in with uh, questions that you have, uh, just type them in and I want to be able to make sure I'm providing you with the information that's going to be most helpful to you. Uh, and again, we are going to spend our time focusing on how to get a better night of sleep. And as Gail said, this is a very timely topic. I'm, I'm hearing from a lot of people that their sleep has been affected by, by everything that's going on. So, so feel free to ask questions that are specific to kind of what's going on these days as well. So what are we going to cover? I'm going to focus on three areas. First, I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about uh, do we even need to sleep? What is sleep for? To get an idea of kind of the, the importance of sleep. Uh, we'll spend most of the time talking about things that you can do to address any sleep problems that you have now or that you might develop in the future. And then at the end, I'll just, just touch briefly on what to do if these things don't work, like what would be potential next steps to managing your, your sleep problems. Okay. So first of all, let's talk about sleep and why we sleep. You know, I often say that one of the things that drew me into wanting to, to focus on this area is the recognition that we spend roughly uh, a third of each day sleeping if we sleep eight hours per night although we know most people are not sleeping eight hours per night but if we if we use that it works out to be about a third of the day which means in a given month we'll have spent about uh, 10 days sleeping 
that means, I'm sorry, I get about 10 days sleeping per month or roughly 120 days per year. So if you live to be 90 years old, you'll have spent roughly 30 years of your life sleeping. But yet when I first learned about this back uh, as in, a, in a class in college, we really didn't have a good sense for what sleep was for. And we've learned that sleep plays a lot of different functions or a lot of purposes to sleep. It allows us to disengage from our environment, so to have kind of a break from just the stimulation of our wakeful days. Uh, we know that sleep plays a very important role in the rest and repair of our body, in particular, a type of sleep called slow wave sleep, which is what this abbreviation SWS is for. It's our deepest sleep. We know that both this slow wave sleep and our rapid eye movement or REM sleep play an important role in memory formation and organization. So when we learn new things during the day, during sleep, those new memories are strengthened. So lack of sleep can impair our ability to, to learn new things. Uh, we know that rapid eye movement sleep plays an important role for emotion regulation. Uh, sleep helps to regulate our hormone. And also, in uh, especially historically as a species, uh, sleep played an important role of safety at night. So instead of saying what is the purpose of sleep, singular, we know that sleep serves many functions. Now, the next question I usually get is, well, how, then how much sleep should I be getting? Um, the, uh, we know that on average, about seven to eight hours is optimal for sleep. And, uh, and you've probably heard that number before. I think that's kind of really kind of gotten out there a lot, that kind of seven to eight hours is optimal. I like to show this slide. This was slide, uh, a slide of a study where they asked a large number of people, almost 2,000 people in the United Kingdom, to report what their desired number of hours of sleep was. So you can see on the bottom here is a different number of hours of sleep per night. And uh, the higher the bar, the more number of people who um, put that, uh, who had said that that's what their desired amount. And it's broken up by men and women. And you can see that most people desired getting between seven and eight hours. Uh, women, on average, uh, desired a little bit more than men. But then if we, uh, and they also asked them, well, how much sleep are you actually getting? And you can see the averaged about seven hours, but some people were getting as low as four, four and a half, five hours, although some people were getting eight, eight and a half, nine. So on average, people were getting about one less hour of sleep uh, per, um, than they wanted to be getting. So their actual sleep length was about an hour less than their desired sleep length. So most people are, uh, or a lot of people are not getting as much sleep as they should be getting. Let's see, let's see this question's coming in. I'm trying to, is it bad to sleep longer than nine hours? So great question. We know that uh, there is actually research showing that sleeping, um, when people sleep less than six hours per night, we call them short sleepers. And we know that being a short sleeper is associated with uh, worse health overall. But there is evidence that people who are long sleepers, not sleeping more than nine hours per night, that's also associated with um, worse health uh, as well. But our understanding of it, it's not so much that uh, the fact that you're sleeping more than nine hours, that's bad for you. What we think is happening is that usually, oftentimes when people are sleeping more than nine hours, they are doing so because of different chronic health conditions that they have. Not always, some people just naturally sleep more than nine hours, but we think that the, the health effects of sleeping more than nine hours is not because of sleeping that long, but because of other health problems people might have. It's a great question. Um, so we, do need to be sleeping. Sleep plays an important function, a lot of important functions, but a lot of us are not getting enough sleep. Okay. Now, why don't we get enough sleep? Well, there's a lot of reasons. It can be because of the situations in our life are especially stressful 
circumstances. Uh, that, that's especially pertinent these days. You know, I often say that when we're under stress, sleep is often the first thing that's impacted. And obviously for a lot of people, these, it's a stressful time right now. And so uh, this, a lot of people's sleep has worsened lately because of the, uh, the stress that they're experiencing. It can become uh, the cause of different physical sensations that people have, in particular pain. So people who have chronic pain problems often don't sleep well. It can because of, of the timing of their sleep, and this has to do more with our what we call our internal clock or our biological clock. So sometimes, uh, so some people, their biological clock is such that they're more of a night owl. Some people are more of a morning person, right? Some people are just in the middle. They're neither extreme. And But if we sleep at a time that's different from our body's internal clock, we tend to not sleep as well. Uh, our health impacts our sleep. So I, I said that our sleep is very important for our health, but it goes the other way as well. When we are sick, when we have a different uh, med, uh, medical problems, that can negatively impact our sleep as well. But oftentimes what we find is that people first develop trouble sleeping for one of these reasons or two or three of these reasons. But then even if the stress resolves or their pain improves or their sleep schedule changes, oftentimes their sleep problems persist. What we've learned is that when you're not sleeping for a while, uh, you can it kind of becomes this, this cycle or this pattern that your body gets stuck into so that even if the situation changes, that that pattern has developed, that I often say it's like a bad habit that your body learns. Okay. And so why do sleep problems often stick around over time? It becomes this learned pattern that our body gets stuck into. Part of my a job is I'm a, as a clinical psychologist, as Gail said, I treat people with sleep disorders. And a lot of the times they'll say, well, when, when did you first start having insomnia? And they'll say, well, it was, I was going through a really stressful period in my life. And I say, well, when was that? And they say, well, that was 20 years ago. So oftentimes I'm treating people who their insomnia has been going on for five, 10, 20, 30 years. And so once this pattern develops, it often sticks around over time. Okay, so actually, before I get to, to that, I'm gonna take a look at a couple questions. What about naps? Can we count them as total sleep time? Do naps have the same functions as night sleep? So naps, I have a slide, we're gonna talk more about naps. And naps, there's pros and cons to napping. Oftentimes the quality of our sleep during naps is not as good as it is at night. We actually don't know if sleep na uh, napping can serve the same function as sleep at night. We don't we don't really know, but generally we, we do know definitely that the quality of, of sleep during naps often is not as good. Let's see. Um, so in terms of one question came out is better sleep positions. Is there any evidence? There's really not a lot of evidence that certain sleep positions are better than others. A lot of it is just a matter of comfort. You just need to, it's just a matter of finding the position that you are most comfortable in. Let's see. Um, how does age factor into? That's a great question. So there's this controversy in the research right now of whether the amount of sleep that we need changes with age. We certainly know that young children need more sleep as do teenagers. There's some evidence that as we get into our you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, that the amount of sleep that we need actually decreases. But there's other studies, there are other studies suggesting that's not true. So it's, it's a bit up in the air right now of whether or not the amount of sleep we need actually goes down with aging. It's, uh, it's, it's a mixed in terms of the evidence. Okay, let me see. Naps. Okay, I think I've gotten to all the questions so far. 
Okay, actually, you know, there's a few more. The way my screen is showing them, it's a little hard to scroll through the different questions. Let me try it a little bit differently. Um, so let me do it this way. Uh, how much slow wave sleep and REM sleep do you need? So great question. Um, one of the things we do know as far as aging is concerned is that the amount of time we spend in that deep slow wave sleep starts to decrease after about age 20 to 25. So there's this slow decrease in how much of this deep sleep we get. So oftentimes, although at age, let's say 60, maybe we're getting the same hours of sleep that we were when we were 30, the amount of time spent in that deep slow wave sleep tends to be less with each decade. Um, REM sleep is more consistent over the lifespan. That doesn't change as much. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I think there's a couple more in here, but let me start to cover some of these strategies. And then, like I said, I will kind of stick around and answer as many of the questions as well. But I'll, I'll continue to, to keep an eye on the questions as they come in. So what I'm going to do now is, and this is really where I'm going to spend most of the rest of the, the talk, is educating you on different things that we do that impact our sleep. So the, you can begin to understand maybe uh, I, looking for I, uh, to identify areas of potential improvement. Now, I should say, I'm going to cover a lot of different things. You may see 20 different areas where you could change your habits or routines. I wouldn't necessarily say try to make 20 changes in the next week, but maybe come away with one to three things that you want to change this week or, or for the next couple weeks and kind of incorporate these changes over time. So first has to do with our sleep schedule. I mentioned our kind of internal biological clock earlier, and one of the best ways to get your body on a good regular rhythm to really set your clock well is just to keep a regular schedule. So ideally, we want to try to pick a wake-up time that we can keep on a consistent basis, and that includes weekends. So a lot of people say, well, Sure, I keep a regular schedule during the week, but on the weekends, I like to sleep in. But when you sleep in on the weekends, that can actually throw off your internal clock. So ideally, you, you do want to try to keep the same schedule each week. Uh, I'm sorry, each, each morning. In terms of the bedtime, it's a slightly different instruction in that you, it is ideal that you want to go to bed around the same time each night. By the way, notice I'm saying around the same time. I'm not saying you need to keep a, be obsessive about a fixed, rigid schedule. I'm just saying try to avoid huge swings in your routine. So around the same wake up time, around the same bedtime. However, there is one exception to the bedtime. Let's say you have chosen 10 p.m. for your bedtime. I'll just use that as an example. Um, if you get to 10 p.m. and for whatever reason, you're just wide awake, maybe your mind is active or you're restless or whatever it may be. If you get to your bedtime and you're just so wide awake, you know you're not going to be able to sleep. It's better to actually push your bedtime later. Wait till 10.15, till 10.30, till 11. But you never want to get into bed if you're just wide awake and alert. You should never get into bed unless you feel sleepy. So keep a regular schedule, bedtime and wake up time. But if you get to your bedtime and you're not sleepy, maybe delay it a little bit. Okay. Now, um, next I want to talk about the effects of some uh, different things that we consume in sleep. So one of the more common things that people use to help themselves sleep or to self-medicate is alcohol. And what we know is that uh, there are kind of two contrasting effects of alcohol. Uh, I'm just going to pull all this. In. So one is what alcohol does to sleep. We know that there is research showing that when people drink alcohol, they tend to fall asleep faster. However, as your body processes or metabolizes the alcohol, it breaks the alcohol down into different kind of chemicals and metabolites that are known to uh, create very shallow, broken sleep. 
So what happens with alcohol is people tend to fall asleep faster, but then they essentially pay the price for the rest of the night with very poor quality sleep. So any initial benefits of alcohol, uh, you tend to don't, don't end, end up getting you better sleep. How about caffeine? So alcohol we consider to be a depressant. Caffeine is of course a stimulant. And we know that caffeine works by blocking a chemical in the brain called adenosine. So as you, the longer you were awake, this chemical adenosine builds up in the brain. And this adenosine makes us feel sleepy. Well, um, when caffeine is blocking the effects of this adenosine so that we're not feeling that sleepiness. It's not getting rid of the adenosine, it's just blocking its effects. So normally adenosine rises over the course of the day with what we call our sleep drive. And blocking adenosine prevents sleepiness and prevents falling asleep. The peak effects of caffeine are typically within about 30 to 60 minutes after you consume it. But the effects can linger for over 12 hours. I mean, everybody's aware of the fact that caffeine uh, too late in the day can affect negatively impact your sleep. But most people are not aware of the fact that it can actually disrupt your sleep for up to 12 hours after you consume it. So the general guideline is to really minimize caffeine, I often say after lunchtime. And so, so kind of trying to keep any caffeine to the morning, coffee, teas, uh, whatever, but even iced teas often contain caffeine. How about another stimulant, nicotine? And a lot of people will say, well, I like to smoke or, or use other forms of nicotine before bed because it helps me to relax. And it may be true at some level, but oftentimes we know that, for example, with smoking, what often is relaxing is actually the deep breathing that people do when they are inhaling from the, the cigarettes. It's often not from the nicotine itself, because nicotine is a stimulant. And so when people, again, smoke or, or use any forms of nicotine close to bedtime, or sometimes people will smoke in the middle of the night when they can't sleep, it often ends up uh, disrupting their sleep because of its stimulant properties. Um, so smoking in the evening can cause difficulties initiating or maintaining sleep. Okay, so I'm gonna actually go back to this. Let me pause and take a look at some of the questions that have come in. Uh, uh, she's getting back to sleep after waking in the middle of the night about three to 5 a.m. If it makes a difference, I'm on CPAP. So uh, the, there's a lot of reasons people wake up in the middle of the night. And all the things that we're talking about today apply to both the beginning of the night and the middle of the night. Uh, and in fact, there's one I'm gonna talk about in, in just a little bit that is, can be particularly helpful for the middle of the night. So I would say everything I'm talking about applies to both the middle of the night and the um, beginning part of the night. Uh, Sorry, I'm having trouble navigating that a bit. Uh, according to my Garmin, I, my deep sleep is about, is less than 25% of my total sleep time. Is that normal? Well, it depends on how they're defining deep sleep, but if it's defining it based on this kind of estimating this slow wave sleep, that yes, that typically, uh, even you know when we're young, we're, we're spending about 20% of the night in that deep sleep. So, so that does sound like a normal amount. Um, see. Can you touch upon sleep apnea? Yes, I'll actually, wait, do I have a slide on sleep apnea? I think I do. I'm going to, yes, a little bit later on. So I will touch on the sleep apnea later on. In fact, I'm going to write that down to make sure I cover that. I'm going to talk about uh, briefly about some other sleep disorders a little bit later. Let's see. Uh, next, okay, I think maybe I've covered them all. 
just kind of trying to scroll through them to make sure I don't miss any. Okay, if I'm missing your questions, um, feel free at any point to kind of type, type them back in in case I'm, I'm missing them. So now I want to switch to talking about our light exposure because we actually know that there's an important role of getting sufficient light exposure in terms of regulating our sleep. So we know that when you get up in the morning, uh, getting bright light in the morning can really help to, it, what it mainly is doing is strengthening your internal clock. So it's not so much affecting your sleep directly, but by getting your body on a good regular rhythm, then in that way, it is uh, improving your sleep, so kind, of, kind of indirectly. So one of the best things to do, uh, especially with the, um, uh, it being the nice, the weather getting nicer, is a, the, that in the morning after you get up for the day, not like as soon as you jump out of bed, but in the first few hours that you're awake, trying to sit by a window or to sit uh, outside, uh, the, um, or to go for a walk outside or do something to get some nice bright sunlight in the morning, that can be really helpful. There it goes. However, light in the evening or at night can be a problem. And in particular, it's kind of this blue-green light is what can happen is at night, our brain produces a hormone called melatonin. I'm going to talk a little bit about melatonin later on. Um, but when we're exposed to bright light at night, and in particular, blue-green light, it can suppress the production of melatonin. And that melatonin is important for regulating our sleep. And so uh, you want to maximize light exposure in the morning. You want to minimize light exposure at night. That doesn't mean sit in a dark room before you go to bed, but it does mean just maybe not having a lot of bright, super bright room lighting on for about an hour before you go to bed at night. Okay. Now here's napping. Someone asked about that earlier. I often say that napping during the day is like snacking between meals. So if you have too large of a snack, you're not going to be as hungry at your next meal. Napping is the same way. Long naps during the day can interfere with your ability to sleep at night. But just like a light snack between meals is often fine, brief naps during the day can be fine as well. So we often say that the reason that this, the idea of a power nap is what the research seems to be supporting. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you're going to take a nap, you want to try to keep it to about uh, a power nap, so about 20 to 30 minutes at most. If you don't currently nap, I'm not necessarily saying I think you should, but if, if you do want to nap, that's kind of a, a, an optimal length for napping. And but not too late in the day. So if you're going to be going to bed at 10 o'clock at night, obviously you wouldn't want to take a nap at uh, 8 o'clock at night. That's going to be too close to uh, your nighttime sleep. So napping can be fine. You just want to keep it from being excessive. Um, I already touched on that. How about then what do you do in bed? So I often say that we think of the bed as a place for sleep. But people do a lot of other things in bed. People, I mean, one of those common things that I hear is that people uh, use the TV in bed. People are on their phones or their computers in bed. Some people tell me they eat in bed or pay bills in bed. People do all sorts of things in bed that have nothing to do with sleep. So what happens as a result is that our body doesn't know what's supposed to happen in bed. Uh, we always say the bed should be really for two things. It should be for sleep and for sexual activity. Ideally, we want to minimize all other activities from the bed. So that way, your body knows that the bed is a place for sleeping. In particular, that worrying or thinking that we might do in bed is, is particularly problematic. So for a lot of people, their bed is the place where they do a lot of their thinking. But what can happen then is that their body learns the bed is a place for thinking. So people will so often tell me, my mind is relatively calm 
But then the moment I get into bed, I start thinking. And that's often a sign that you spend so much time worrying or thinking in bed that your body has learned that connection. So as I said, we want to remove as many of these things from the bed as possible. So that the bed is really mainly for sleep and sexual activity. And that's about it. Okay. How about trying to sleep? Oftentimes we get into bed and maybe we're, our mind's relatively calm and relaxed. Maybe we're not thinking yet or worrying yet or, or feeling restless yet. But after a little bit, we start to think about the fact that we're not sleeping. And usually that leads to just trying to sleep. But as you've probably experienced, trying to sleep rarely works. So I want you to think about when you've been in bed and you're trying to sleep, what ends up happening? Typically, we end up just feeling more awake and alert. Sleep is one of those things that the harder you try to do it, the harder it is to actually do. And so what you want to do is by following the, the guidelines for, uh, we're covering today, I often say what you're doing is you're creating the right circumstances to allow sleep to happen. So you can get into bed and allow sleep to happen. It still may not. I mean, you can do everything right and sleep still may not happen. But if you try to force sleep to happen, chances are that's just going to make things worse. How about relaxation? So instead of you know, trying to sleep in bed is just going to create this state of mental and physical tension. Instead, we want to try to create a state of relaxation. And so relaxation is an active process of slowing down and reducing tension in your mental activity in terms of your thoughts, in terms of your feelings or emotions, and in terms of your behavior and your physiology, your, so your, your body. And so what you can do is learn one or more different relaxation techniques that you can use before bed. And these can be things like deep breathing techniques, different forms of uh, mindfulness meditation. One that I like to use is what's called progressive muscle relaxation, where you systematically relax the different muscle groups of your body. There are forms of what are called guided imagery, or even certain types of uh, yoga. There are some types of yoga that are more active and movement-based, but some are more kind of relaxing types of movements that you can do. So what I often encourage people to do is to make sure that you know at least one of these types of relaxation techniques. And what I find is that some people like one, some people like another. So I'm not gonna say that everybody needs to do deep breathing or everybody needs to do progressive muscle relaxation. I encourage you to try different ones until you find one that you like. Now, how can you try these different exercises? Well, this is where the internet can actually be really helpful. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you go on the internet or even on like YouTube and search for relaxation exercises, You'll find all kinds of recordings and videos and tools that you can use. So I encourage you to experiment with different ones until you find one that you like. And then to incorporate that into your nighttime routine. So to use these relaxation exercises um, before you get into bed at night, or if you wake up in the middle of the night to use these relaxation exercises to, see, to help to get in a relaxed state, to hopefully fall back to sleep more quickly. Now, earlier I was talking about the fact that we often are in a state of uh, what we call sleep restriction. I didn't use that term back then, but the idea is restriction, meaning we're not in bed, we're not getting enough time in sleep. But oftentimes people who are not sleeping well do the opposite where they use what we call sleep extension, where you say, well, if I'm going to, if I'm not, I'm having, not getting enough sleep, I'm not sleeping well, so I'm gonna start spending more time in bed. And sometimes I talk to people who are in bed 
10, 11, 12 hours a day. They may only be getting six or seven hours of sleep, but they're spending a huge amount of time in bed. But what we've learned is that spending too much time in bed can actually make things worse. It can negatively impact your natural sleep regulation. So even if you're not getting enough sleep, you wanna to try to avoid excessive time in bed. And by excessive, I'd say, you, know, you probably don't wanna spend more than eight and a half to nine hours maximum in bed per night. So if you're doing more than that, you may want to restrict how much time you spend in, in bed. Okay. So this takes us through a lot of the different strategies that I wanted to make sure that I covered. I'm not but done with my presentation, but this is kind of a nice natural point to take a look at any other questions that have come in. Let me scroll through. Oh, here's one I, that, uh, I, that I didn't see before. This might be new. Does dreaming have any effect on the quality of sleep? So our dreaming mostly occurs in our rapid eye movement sleep, which is, is one of the important stages or types of sleep that we get. There can be this effect of sometimes we have this feeling of just like dreaming really intensely and actually feeling less rested the next day. Um, we actually don't know totally what to make of that. that. That has not really been a topic that has been investigated scientifically, but I know I've experienced that. I've talked to a lot of people who experience that. And so there, there may be some relationship between dreaming and the quality of sleep, but we don't really kind of understand it very well at this point. Uh, here's a nice example of a question in terms of relaxation. Does instrumental calming music benefit or help sleep? Um, how much before sleep would you recommend PMR or mindfulness to, to sounds? So a lot of people do find it helpful to listen to some calming music as a form of relaxation. And some people even like to do that in bed. Something like kind of relaxing, calming music or nature sounds, something like that can be very helpful uh, and, and relaxing for people. But what I would recommend that you avoid is like having say uh, the TV on in the background, especially a lot of people tell me they like to use the TV for background noise. But what happens is even when you fall asleep, your brain is still listening to the TV, even if it's at a low volume. So I generally recommend kind of something like some calming music or a fan or something like that instead of the TV. Does snoring have an effect on the quality of sleep? I'll actually when I talk about sleep apnea in just a little bit, I'm going to I'll tie the snoring into that. Uh, medications I'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, how can I get the effects of bright sunlight given all the gray days we've been having? Great question. So what's interesting is even when it looks like a gray day to us, it's actually much brighter than we realize. So even on a cloudy day, the amount of light outside is actually still more than you're going to get from like bright room lighting. Now, this person did ask about particular lamps. You can augment the light outside with lights, uh, lamps that are really bright. Like these are lamps that were typically originally designed for people who get depressed in, to, in the winter because of the short days, what we call seasonal affective disorder, seasonal depression. But I do know people who purchase those lamps online to just use, just to, to increase their overall amount of light exposure that they're getting during the day. So those can be helpful. Uh, let's see, I touched on that. Room temperature and humidity, that's a great question. Humidity we know less about in terms of room temperature. We tend to get more deep sleep in a cool bedroom. Not cold, but cool bedroom seems to be optimal. But of course, what is cool varies from person to person. So what one person considers cool, another person considers warm. So trying to have your bedroom be kind of a cool temperature for you is ideal. Uh, but again, humidity, we don't really know. Um, oh, how, how, when should you stop drinking alcohol? Great, I should have mentioned that on that slide, that um, generally you wanna minimize alcohol 
within a couple of a, a couple of hours before bed. Is, is a, and I'm not saying like you can never have a drink close to bed, but trying to have avoid that as a regular practice. I'm having trouble sleeping during the night and then I fall asleep when it's time to get up, causing me to sleep late in the morning. That can often be, oftentimes when that happens, it's a sign that that's, that your, your internal clock, your biological clock, is just naturally on a later schedule. That you may be just more of a night owl biologically. Uh, in that case, sometimes really increasing the, your exposure to light in the morning can sometimes help to shift your internal clock earlier. Um, staying up all night, twisting and turning, I don't fall asleep. Actually, very similar question. You know, uh, uh, oh, actually, it was, actually, it was the same individual. So, 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 so related to that. Okay. Um, I get up at least three times a night to use the bathroom. Uh, Tests for sleep apnea are indeterminate. And so, what's hard is. The, the strategies I'm talking about uh, will not necessarily reduce the number of times that you may need to get up to use the bathroom in the night. We can, most people, we consider to, to kind of having to get up one to two times a night for the bathroom to be normal. So three times a night is in a little bit more than that. But hopefully using these strategies can help to make it so that you're not up for very long, that you get up, use the bathroom, and then you can get back to sleep uh, more quickly. I've heard many times that sleep before my night counts double in terms of quality. That's sort of true. The idea is that the deep, the deepest sleep tends to happen in the first half of the night. So it's not so much midnight per se, but our deepest sleep does tend to be in the first half of our sleep. Uh, but we still, we, but we spend in the second half of the night is when most of our dreaming occurs. And so we um, do, we need both types of sleep. So, so yes, our deepest sleep is in the first part of the night, but that doesn't mean we don't need to sleep later in the night. Okay, let me answer one or two more. Let me see if there's in front. Okay, I kind of touched on that already. And there's a medication question. I'll wait for that in just a minute. Uh, melatonin, I'll touch on that in just a minute. My sleep schedule shifts when returning from travel to other time zones. How do I shift my sleep schedule back? Um, the best thing there is the, the light exposure is, well, is one, getting on back on a regular sleep schedule at home. And the morning light exposure it can be really helpful for reducing jet lag. Okay, so let me go back to my slides. Again, I, I will to continue to answer questions, uh, especially I'll save time at the end, I'll, I'll answer questions. In fact, you know what I'll do is I'll go through the rest of my slides now, and then I'll, I'll go through the rest of the questions. Okay, so what if this stuff doesn't work? So if you're following these healthy sleep habits, so for example, you may have heard all the stuff I'm, I'm suggesting and say, I'm doing all that stuff well, and I'm not sleeping, or you may identify areas of change, but you're still, and you make changes, but a couple of months from now, you're still having difficulty falling asleep. You're still having frequent awakenings during the night. Maybe getting having difficulty getting back to sleep. Or maybe waking up feeling unrefreshed and having trouble staying awake during the day. So if these are becoming persistent problems, that may indicate that you have a sleep disorder that uh, might warrant kind of additional medical attention. So if that's the case for you, if you feel like, yeah, you know, I'm doing these things well and I'm just not sleeping well, <clears throat> or I'm, you know, again, you make a lot of the changes I'm suggesting and your sleep is just not improving, uh, it's worthwhile talking to your, your primary care provider and getting a referral, talking to them about your sleep problems and considering getting a referral for to see a sleep specialist. They may recommend an overnight sleep study, but a, for a lot of sleep disorders, it, that's not needed. But it is important to get sleep disorders treated. Now, I'm gonna focus on treatments uh, for insomnia, but this is probably a good point to talk about sleep apnea, which uh, 
I think I had a slide in and I might have taken it out. So for anyone not familiar with sleep apnea, it is a sleep disorder related to our breathing in our sleep. And the most common type is what we call obstructive sleep apnea, where we're trying to breathe, but the tissue in our airway relaxes in our sleep and it ends up covering or ob obstructing our airway so that the air is not getting through. So it's usually not a problem that with trying to breathe, it's a problem with airflow. And this happens throughout the night. Now, for a lot of people, th this tissue relaxes when they sleep and it vibrates as they breathe in and out. And that's the most common cause of snoring. Now, most people who have sleep apnea snore, but lots of people who snore do not have sleep apnea. And for, pe for people who snore but don't have sleep apnea, unless their snoring is really loud, oftentimes it's not, it's usually not impacting the quality of their sleep. Now, it may be impacting the quality of their bed partner's sleep, but uh, um, they're actually the bed partner is often more likely to get disrupted than the person themselves. Now, but if you do snore loudly, if you wake up gasping for air during the night, if you have morning headaches, that may be an indication. Those are symptoms of sleep apnea. And uh, it definitely that would be a reason to talk with your, your primary care doctor about it and to see if a sleep study is warranted to measure your breathing in sleep. The main treatment for sleep apnea is what someone mentioned in one of the questions, what's called CPAP, which is short for continuous positive airway pressure, which is a mask that people wear that connects to, by, there's tubing that connects it to a machine that sits next to the bed. And it basically just pumps air down our airway all night long to keep this our airway open. It's not the most fun thing to wear. If any of you, you know, wear one, you know it's, it's not a lot of fun. And for some people, wearing the CPAP ends up making it harder to sleep at night. So that can be a problem. Um, if that's the case for you, if, you're tr if you have CPAP but you're having trouble wearing it at night, I often re recommend that people wear it during the day. Maybe to wear it, not necessarily turning the air on, but just to wear their mask while they're reading or watching TV during the day just to get used to the equipment because it can, can it make be, it, it can be quite an adjustment for some people. Okay. So in terms of treatments for insomnia, kind of beyond kind of what we're talking about today, the most common treatment is sleeping medications. Um, and there's lots of medications used for sleep. Some of them were specifically designed to treat insomnia. But a lot of the medications uh, are, um, were not designed for insomnia. They were designed for other purposes, but they found that they tended to make people feel sleepy. And so they started, so people started using it for, uh, for insomnia instead. But for a lot of those medications, there's not a lot of evidence that they work very well. The other main option is a non-medication treatment called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, or what we abbreviate as CBTI for short. So as a psychologist, I can't prescribe medications. So what I mainly do clinically with my patients is this CBTI approach. So this is a, a what we call a manualized behaviorally focused treatment that involves a series of strategies that we call sleep restriction, stimulus control, what's called sleep hygiene, relaxation, and what are called cognitive therapy components. And we know that this treatment works really well for the majority of people who go through it. Um, if you were to go through CBTI, a lot of the things that I've been talking about, you may recognize because some of the strategies that I've been giving you are, a lot of them are some of the basic components of this CBTI approach, but there are there's much more to, to this CBTI. In terms of the sleeping medications, as I said, there are a lot of them. I'm not going to try to go through this list, but just to, this is just to give you an idea of how many different medications there are out there that are used for sleep. Now, I did want to mention melatonin 
Um, a lot of people try melatonin for insomnia. It's typically sold uh, over the counter with like the vitamins or supplements. These are just different forms of melatonin that are available. And there is a, are a, have been a, a number of studies now looking at melatonin as a treatment for insomnia, most of which have found that it's actually not a very effective treatment. It is much more effective as what we call a chronobiotic, meaning it targets our body's internal clock rather than acting as a sleeping pill. So sometimes we have people use it for uh, when their sleep problems are related to problems with their internal clock, but that's kind of a different category than just regular insomnia. So what I'm going to do is um, summarize, but then what I will do is, like I said, go back to the questions and try to answer as many of the questions that have not yet been addressed. So for sleep problems, sleep is important. Sleep is an important part of health. I probably didn't need to convince you all of that because you probably wanted to be part of this webinar in the first place because of your recognition that sleep is important for your health. Um, there are non-medication behavioral and cognitive approaches that are very effective. You've kind of learned some of the basic strategies that go into these approaches. Um, but there are medication approaches as well. Uh, I'm not opposed to using medication for sleep problems. You know, each approach has its pros and its cons. And if you do have you know, severe sleep problems or ongoing sleep problems that these strategies are not helpful with, don't help with, definitely work with your health care providers to find what the right option is for you and whether it would be helpful to actually go to a sleep clinic for further evaluation and treatment. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go back to the questions and see where I left off. I realized I did not have them sorted in order that they came in, so I wanna make sure I didn't miss any. Oh, yes. Touched on those. So I'm just getting cut right to the, to the right point. Okay, so I touched on this. Hopefully, I answered the questions about sleep apnea that came through. Oh, Phil, while you're looking at that, I'd just like to ask you a question about the yeah. um, CT for insomnia. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in that, where could they find that treatment? For, I'm sorry, for which I, I, I missed. Oh, for the for the CBT for insomnia? Uh, great question. So uh, most sleep clinics, uh, or a lot of sleep clinics offer it. Um, it's Sometimes it can be challenging to find someone in your area who provides it. Fortunately, in, in this, in the kind of the Philadelphia metropolitan region, there's quite a few of us who specialize in this. Uh, so the best bet is probably to go through a local sleep clinic to uh, see to, they will probably have someone there or someone that they can refer you to for treatment. Okay, thank you. So one question related to medication, this was particular for, for taking Tylenol, is is it addictive? So in terms of both anything over the counter or prescription uh, for uh, medications for sleep, most of them do not have a lot of potential for what we call a physical addiction or dependence but they all have the potential for what we call psychological addiction or psychological dependence is, is the technical term. And the idea is if you're taking something and you develop the belief, I need to take this. Uh, if I don't, I'm not going to sleep. That's what we call dependence. And because what often happens is if you believe I need to take this to sleep and then you don't take it, Oftentimes, that means you're going to be more anxious about your ability to sleep, and that's going to end up making it harder to sleep. And so, so that's a, so any of these have the potential to develop that dependence. Um, one question going back to the light is what lights are in the blue green spectrum? Yeah, I should have mentioned that. So, the reason I mention I, I, I high often emphasize the blue green spectrum is because, like most of your room lighting. It's going to be full spectrum light. It's going to have blue green, but it's going to have all the other colors of the rainbow as well. The exception is electronic devices. So computers, cell phones, tablets, they often are strongest in the blue 
part, blue green part of the spectrum. So it's those electronics, especially because we tend to use a lot of those electronics fairly close to our eyes. Those are where you have to be most concerned about the blue green light. And what do you think about the light blocking glasses? So those are interesting. So there are a lot of um, uh, glasses out there that filter out the blue light. They vary in how much of the blue light they filter out. And I don't know of a particular brand to recommend. So some of them do a really nice job of that. So you can wear them you know, for an hour before you go to bed and it'll help to minimize that blue light. Uh, but they, they do just be aware they vary in how well that they work. Okay, that sounds good. And what about things like chamomile tea or um, having a late night snack with protein and carbohydrates? I've heard all these things. Yeah, there's not a lot of research on them, so it's hard to say anything conclusive. I think a lot of it is just personal preference. If there are things that you find helpful, like I often encourage people to be like a scientist of your own sleep and to experiment, to try, to try different things and see what works for you. Um, one question asked about, is there harm in using melatonin at night? And so, so I kind of argue that the research shows that for most people it's not very helpful. But on the other hand, there's not a lot of evidence that it's harmful either. So if you're finding it helpful, it's probably okay. Of course, it's always good to talk about anything over the counter, any supplements that you're taking with your primary care provider so that they're aware of it. But there's not a lot of evidence that, that melatonin is harmful. Yeah. Um, here's a great question. Can an electronic device like Fitbit accurately report sleep length and quality? I get that question a lot these days. How good are these wearable devices? The problem is we don't know because these studies, that these companies don't they probably do a lot of testing on their own of how accurate they are, but they don't make those the results of their testing available. So we actually don't have the information we need to know how good they are. I mean, they're probably reasonably accurate, but uh, for some people, they, 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 one of the biggest problems with these types of devices is for people who, who remember, they're not measuring sleep, they're measuring movement. And they're using your patterns of movement to try to guess if you're asleep. So if you spend a lot of time awake but sitting still, it's going to think that that is tend to think that that is sleep. That's often where they're less accurate. How can you stop worrying or thinking in bed? Um, well, one thing is if you're doing a lot of thinking or worrying in bed, is maybe it's best to actually take a break, get up, get out of bed and do something relaxing until your mind has settled down and then um, return to bed. Because it's often hard to calm our mind down when we're lying in bed. Um, let's see. Another question in terms of how to reduce the number of times you have to get up to use the bathroom at night. I mean, the obvious thing obviously is to reduce liquids close to bedtime but chances are you've already done that because a lot of people just have to get up to use the bathroom frequently regardless of, of their liquid intake. And that's tough. I mean, that, the, the strategy I'm talking about probably won't impact that. That's, if, it's, if you have not already spoken with your doctor about that, it's probably something worth, worth, worth mentioning. But that, that can be a tough one. Again, the strategies I've talked about may help with getting back to sleep more quickly if you need to get up to use the bathroom, but it won't tend to reduce that. Um, it's interesting. So someone who, who used to live, grew up in California and tends to sleep better in that time zone than other ones. That That's an interesting one because I've heard that from other people. It should be that as you live in other places that your body just naturally adjusts to the different time zones. But what it could have to do with is, the, again, the, the light exposure, because where you are in your time zone or what time zone you're in, or especially with latitude, that's going to be different patterns of daylight. And that, that could be the explanation. <coughs> is watching TV. By the way, I recognize we are 
we're just about at 12. I will continue to answer questions, but if you know anyone needs to, to get off at 12, obviously, you know, at any point you can. Uh, thank you for pausing, um, Dr. Gurman. I really appreciate yeah. that. I just, you know, just wanted to, because it, the webinar is scheduled to end at 12, I just wanted to let, let those know that, um, that do have to get off. We really appreciate you attending. And that after you leave, you're going to receive a quick five question survey. And we'd really appreciate it if you could take just a few moments to provide your feedback, just so we can continue to improve in the future as we bring more bigger wellness webinars your way. And also, you'll receive a follow-up email within four hours with a link to review a recording of today's webinar. So you can view it again and again, or feel free to share it with others if you like. Um, and that email will also contain information about our next bigger wellness webinar, Journey to Holism, Living a Full Life, which will be held from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. on Tuesday, May 12th. And you can also find recordings of our past wellness webinar on the Friends Life Care website. And also for Friends Life Care members, um, hopefully you're receiving our weekly emails that we're sending um, on Wednesday mornings with mindfulness series where we're talking about mindfulness during this um, challenging time. Uh, for those of you who didn't see them in your email or those of you who are not members, please go to our website, friendslifecare.org and go under the resources tab to uh, wellness webinars and you can, you can check those out. And I really appreciate you listening. And, and um, Dr. Berman, thank you again for this wonderful presentation and thank you for staying on to answer the rest of the questions. So for My those pleasure. who are leaving, please come back. And for those of you who are staying, we have lots more information for you. Great. So one question that came up was, uh, that someone asked is, is it harmful to watch TV before bed? I don't worry about the light exposure from TV too much because most people don't sit with the TV super close to their face and that's really kind of where the, the problem tends to be. Sometimes though it's an issue of what people are watching on TV. Like a lot of people like to watch um, the news before bed. But I always say, I don't know about you, I don't, I don't normally watch the news and afterwards feel nice and relaxed because everything is good with the world. And so a lot of people find cutting out the news and making sure you're watching relaxing programming before bed can be helpful. Um, question about weighted blanket, that's kind of a, a real hot topic these days. A lot of people are promoting the use of, of weighted blankets. The short answer is we don't know. I'm, just really, I'm not aware of any research on weighted blankets. Again, I think a lot of it is a matter of personal comfort and finding what you like. Um, someone said they get seven hours of sleep and still don't feel refreshed. And well, one, it could be that you need more than seven hours. It's kind of like the, the, the obvious one, but it, that can be a sign that there's just something wrong with the quality of the sleep that you're getting, which again, was probably worth talking with your providers about in case there's anything medical going on that could be impacting the quality of your sleep. Um, Question, oh, I appreciate that. I, I like the way this was phrased. I appreciate you're not a dermatologist or an eye specialist, but what's the connection between eye bags, under eyes, and sleep? So a lot, certainly the um, lack of sleep can make kind of uh, bags under the eyes worse. And uh, I actually don't know what the mechanisms is, what the biology of that is, but a lot of, the, a lot of that is actually not related to sleep. So a lot of the age-related changes we experience un under the eyes is not related to sleep, but sleep can certainly contribute to it. Um, and another question, I kind of touched on this earlier, but I think it bears repeating, is it different, do you use different techniques in the middle of the night than the beginning of the night? Not really, but I mean, a lot of times we recommend the same types of strategies, regardless of when in the night you are um, having trouble sleeping. What do you suggest for REM sleep disorder? So that's a sleep disorder in which, so uh, actually let me back up. Normally when we are in our REM sleep, our rapid eye movement sleep, um, our body is actually paralyzed. Our muscles are paralyzed and that actually prevents us from acting out our dreams. Well, REM sleep disorder is a disorder in which there's a failure of that muscle paralysis to develop. And so what can happen is people end up acting out their dreams and uh, they can sometimes injure themselves or their bed partners. And uh, so that is, uh, that's definitely something you would wanna be evaluated in a sleep clinic for. 
And when it's problem, you know, when people are injuring themselves, oftentimes it is treated with different prescription sleep medications. Um, what about marijuana as a sleep aid? That's a great question. I get that one a lot as well. Um, the research on the effects of marijuana is actually similar to the effects of alcohol. That marijuana tends to help us fall asleep more quickly, but as our body metabolizes marijuana, it tends to fragment the quality of the sleep that we get. So on average, the sleep that people get from marijuana tends to not be as uh, restful. Uh, any comment on sleep three over the counter medication? I don't know the specifics of that one, although I can tell you most of, oh, and actually it's funny, the very next question is about diphenhydramine. So diphenhydramine is an antihistamine. It's the active ingredient in like Benadryl. And that's what is in most of the over-the-counter sleep aids. Uh, so I don't specifically know that for sleep three, but most over-the-counters, that's what they have in them. Uh, diphenhydramine is notorious for what we call hangover effects. So people might sleep better, but then they feel lousy the next morning, groggy, sometimes a headache, dry mouth. Uh, and it's, it's generally not recommended for, for long-term use. The light from something like a Kindle, that tend, my understanding is the Kindle also does tend to be strongest in the blue-green portion of the spectrum. Uh, Benadryl before bed, I just touched on that, but having real success with CBD oil, any comment? I would love to be able to comment on that because that's another question I get a lot these days. Uh, we don't know. Uh, the research really hasn't been done on the effects of CBD oil in sleep, so, so I don't know. Um, recommend for leg cramps during the night? That's a hard one to answer because leg cramps can come from a lot of different uh, sources. I mean, it's not for some people, doing some light stretching before bed can be helpful. For some people, it's more a reflection of kind of what they're doing during the day in terms of physical activity or lack of physical activity. Uh, so that, that's a hard one to answer because there's, there's, a, there's so many different reasons why that can happen. A psychologist once told me it was unhealthy that I fall asleep very quickly, 10 to 15 seconds after turning off the light. Is that true? Not necessarily. I tend to fall asleep very quickly myself. Some people just fall asleep very easily. Now, some people, uh, if uh, falling asleep very quickly can be an indication that someone's just sleep deprived, that they're not getting enough sleep. But sometimes people, even when they're well rested, just fall asleep very quickly. So, so as long as you feel like you're getting a good night of sleep and that you're not sleep deprived, no, there's nothing wrong with being someone who falls asleep quickly. Uh, is the blue light filter app effective when you're using the phone? So what they're talking about is um, cell phones these days, most of them have uh, built into them a, a, in the display settings. You can set it so that it filters out blue light at night. Um, I don't know what percent of the blue light that filters out, so it's similar to the glasses that way, but it, it's, I definitely recommend people using that if you're going to be on electronics at night. Okay, and I think that was the last one. So uh, if I skipped your question, I apologize. I think I managed to get through all of them. So, so hopefully this, this answered all of your questions. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Gorman. That was an absolutely wonderful, wonderful presentation and lots and lots of information. Um, so hopefully we'll all be sleeping better tonight because of this. Um, I thank hope so. you uh, for joining us and thank you everyone for listening in today. And remember, you'll get your recording probably within four hours. And please remember to fill out the survey at the end because it really helps uh, when we get feedback so we know what you like about our webinars and what else you'd like to see. So thank you much, um, very much for joining us and have a lovely day.